be from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. That's Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Well, good morning. good morning, and grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to see you this morning, uh, both our visitors and our members. I do want to let you know that if you don't have a copy of God's Word and you're visiting with us uh, this morning, there are Bibles on the back, uh, free for your taking. We want you to have a copy of God's Word. We believe it will change your life. It will help you in so many ways to know our God and our Lord and Savior Jesus. So make sure to grab one of those uh, before you leave uh, today. I also want to encourage our members. Uh, we've talked about our little fall festival and trunk or treat thing that we do uh, here at the church. We've done it for the past few years. It's been a great thing for the community. We have hundreds and hundreds of members uh, from the community that come through here uh, on their way to trick or treat with their families. And I want to encourage you to help with that if you can, uh, to come and to decorate your cars and uh, bring some candy for the kids. You'll enjoy spending time with them and spending time together as a fellowship, as a family in the Lord and it's a good work and so I want to encourage you to do that if you have any questions about it you can get with me or Parker we're really looking forward to that you know growing up uh, some of my favorite memories as a child were spent when we would gather together as a family for what we called a family reunion now we don't do those as often as we as we used to but but I always really enjoyed them I always have very fond memories of them, and maybe you do as well. It was a, a time when, when our family would come from all over the, the state and, and maybe from other states, and we would enjoy uh, times of eating good food and, and having fun and, and just enjoying being together. You would see, uh, you would see great aunt what's-her-face and uh, uh, great uncle what's-his-name, and, um, and you would never remember who they were. Uh, but they would always squeeze your cheeks and give you kisses more than you often would want as a kid. And... But it didn't really matter if you remembered them or not because, because you were family. And, and by the time that the day would end, they would kind of settle over all of us this, this feeling of home and this feeling of family. And those are some very fond memories that I have. And it's mainly because some of the happiest moments that we experience as humans are with people that we have some common bond with. Whether it's the bond of blood or the bond of belief. Those are some of our most joyful memories. When we're around people that we share something in common, we, we have something in common and so it shouldn't surprise us that Paul comes in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2 and he says, complete my joy. Complete it by being like-minded, having the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. The apostle says there, my joy is incomplete. My, my joy isn't what I want it to be unless we are unified. Unless you're unified. Unless we're one. My, my joy is invested in that. My happiness is invested on how unified we are as a people of God. Now this might have been spurred by an incident that we'll later read of in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2. Between two sisters in Christ later on. There might have been some rift in the congregation. Maybe some, some conflict. And he's calling them to unity. saying, I want you to be one. I want you to be together. But isn't that true? Isn't it true that as Christians, our joy in Jesus is tied directly to the unity that we share as believers? And, and, and we can know that this is true because if you've ever been a part of a church that's divided and that is not unified and that is having strife in the midst of it, you know how much that can hamper your joy 
as a Christian. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22 reminds us that we're born again. Why? For a sincere love of the brethren. You know what Peter's saying there? He's saying you're born again. You're given new life so that you can learn to love other Christians. That, so that you can have a sincere and genuine love for other people that love Jesus like you love Jesus. Sadly, today it seems that Christians are more divided every day. Churches are splitting. Relationships are being broken. And as Christians, as Jesus followers, we must revive our passion for pursuing Christian unity and thus guard the joy that we take in unity. But in order for us to do that, we have to understand the unity that we possess. The center of which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're continuing a series that we started a few weeks ago called Joyful Faith. And it's a series that we're doing through the book of Philippians. And we want to learn how we can take more joy in our faith, according to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 25. And this morning, we want to look at the joy of unity. The joy of unity. As we do, be opening your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible, it will be on the screen to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we'll be starting in verse 1 and go down to about verse 8. Paul writes there, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So as we get into our text this morning... We need to, in order for us to take joy in unity, in order for our, 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 our faith, our joyful faith, to take joy in the unity that we have as Christians, we first need to understand the basis, the foundation of our unity. And the basis of our unity is this, what we share in Jesus Christ. That's the foundation for our unity. Now, we need to understand that one of the reasons that that people can't be unified at times is because they misunderstand and they misplace uniformity for unity. They misplace uniformity for unity. And friends, uniformity and unity are not the same things. Uniformity comes from outside pressure to conform to something because of fear or exclusion or overly, overly binding rules. And so you, you, you make people conform to something and you kind of force people together. That's uniformity. Unity is something in which people come together because of their shared beliefs. Because of something that has happened inwardly. A transformation that has occurred where you believe something and share something that I believe. And we come together and we're unified on those things. That's what unity is. That's the difference between uniform. And the, the, the problem is, is that sometimes they can look similar. Sometimes they can look very similar. But listen, this is how I heard it growing up in East Texas. You can tie two cats together by the tail. They're, they're united, but they're not unified, right? <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I heard it told growing up. They're united, but they're not unified. Now, Paul makes the case for unity by appealing to the benefits that we all share, that the Philippians shared. He said, you all share something in Jesus. You share a new life. You've all experienced something by coming to Jesus. I, I like how this one translation says, it, might put, it puts it in a little bit more contemporary language for us. It says, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if His love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor Agree with each other, love each other, 
Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Essentially what Paul is saying is, listen, if you, if you care at all, if you've experienced any of these things by coming to know Jesus, if, if you've experienced the love of Jesus in your life, if you've experienced the comfort that comes from being in fellowship with God, if you, if you know that, then be united. In fact, the language that he's using here, he's so certain that this is the case that we could replace if with since because the language is very strong. And essentially what he's saying is since you've experienced this, you should seek after unity. If your new life in Jesus means any thing to you, then pursue Christian unity. It's maybe similar to a family member who's experienced great heartache from another family member and great disunity. And they come together at Thanksgiving and they try to work things out, but maybe another, the other person is not wanting to work it out. And the other family member turns to them and says, listen, if our family means anything to you, if the blood that runs through our veins means anything to you, if the memories and, that we've shared and the experiences we've had together, if that means anything to you, then let's try and be unified. And so that's what Paul is saying here. The basis of our unity is, is the fact that if we're here together, we've all experienced something in Jesus. And, and, and he's saying, if that means anything, then we've got to fight for this. But what that also means is that if people haven't genuinely experienced these things, they're not going to desire unity. If, if, if for some people, all that church has been, all that Christianity has been, has been some punch your ticket, sit in the seat, ride your way to heaven type of deal, and they've never really experienced inward transformation, and they've never really witnessed the love of Jesus in their lives, if they haven't really shared that, then there's really no basis for unity. Because you can't come to them and say, well, if, if this means anything to you. Because it doesn't mean anything to them. And so Paul's saying, we have to come together in this shared life that we have within Jesus. This is the basis for our unity. The fact that we all need grace. You needed God's grace. I needed God's grace. By the way, as a family, as a Christian family, that's what we're confessing when we partake of this supper. I needed Jesus. I needed His body and His blood. I need Jesus now for this week. I need the forgiveness that comes from this. And I'm going to need Him in the future. I need Jesus and the person sitting across the church who I hardly ever see, who's partaking of it in faith, they need Jesus too. That's the basis for our unity. We're a community that is shaped by the cross. And you've been born again, if you've been born again in Jesus, trying to reject a brother in Christ is just as, as wrong as trying to reject your own brother who's got the same blood running through his veins. You can't change that. You might not like your brother. You might have problems with your sister. But you can't change your DNA. You can't change the blood. There's a bond there that goes beyond even us. In fact, Paul uses such strong language that he's essentially drawing a line in the sand. He's saying, listen, if you fail to pursue unity in Christ with other Christians, then you are really denying that there is any encouragement in Christ, that there's any comfort from love the love of Christ, if there's any participation with God in the Spirit. He said, you're really denying all of these things if you fail to pursue Christian unity. But our unity is different from what we may experience with non-Christians. You, you might be a part of different groups, maybe different civic clubs or social clubs, maybe a Lions Club or something along those lines. And, and you have different things that you do together with that group. But our unity that we have as Christians is different from some social club. Because it's not just shared upon experience. It also is shared on deeply held beliefs that we have. And something that is greater than ourselves. So next we want to look from the text. The character or the quality of our unity. Which is what we believe about Jesus. 
the character or the quality of our unity, which is what we believe about Jesus. Notice that he says back in Philippians chapter 2, we're to be of one mind or we're to have the same mind. So it speaks of us thinking and speaking the same way. He says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind, in the same judgment. What he's talking about there is that you're confessing and speaking the same truth, that you're believing the same things. As he says in Romans chapter 15 and verse 6, so that we with one voice may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unity cannot be separated from truth. Those two things go hand in hand. In fact, unity apart from truth is just sentimentality. That's all it is. It's just, well, I kind of like you, so let's get together. The church is not like a social club. The church... Well, the church is more like a, an army. In fact, that's what it's described at times. The church is an army on a mission. It's on a mission for the, for the cause of Christ. And can you imagine soldiers that are on a mission suddenly deciding that they don't agree on the mission anymore? That, that there's rules and things that they don't agree on. What's going to happen to the mission? It's going to fail. And so Paul says in this mission of trying to help others to see Jesus Christ and to proclaim His name and to, and to help the nations become obedient to the gospel, you've got to be united in what you teach. That's the whole point of the restoration movement that we're trying to be a part of is, is to be unified. Yes, yes, be unified, but be unified with truth at its center. This means we're upholding and committing to these central biblical doctrines, the person of Christ, the coming judgment, spiritual worship, the inspiration of Scripture, righteous living, these things that really mean something that we have to believe. In fact, these beliefs are so strong, they're so tied to the unity of the church that Paul would tell the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2, 15-16, that if someone doesn't hold to the traditions that they were passing down, that they were to be excluded from the community of the church. I mean, if you think about it, that makes sense. If you no longer believe in the mission, if you no longer believe what the rest of the family believes about where you're going and what you're doing, well, then why are you a part of the community? See, that, that, that there shows us how strong... They, now, there, there are other points... Other minor points, even in our interpretation of Scripture, where we might have to sit down and talk and, and work through these things and be patient with each other. And we have to do that. Uh, we have to do that in a spirit of, of humility, areas where there might be disagreement about things. And we have to make sure that we're pursuing unity even in that. Not trying to find areas where we can divide, but trying to find ground where we can unite. But here's the problem. Often when discussing these issues, even minor issues within the church, there are barriers which get in the way of true unity. There are barriers. And Paul mentions those here. And that's what we want to look at next. The barriers to unity, which occurs when we fail to focus on Jesus. When we fail to focus on Jesus. The basis of our unity is what we share in Jesus. The character of our unity is what we believe about Jesus. But the barriers to our unity are what happen when we fail to focus on Jesus. There are two character flaws that will prevent Christian unity every single time. And Paul mentions them here in verse 3. They are selfish ambition and pride. Do nothing. Verse 3. From selfish ambition... Or conceit. Listen, if someone is concerned about promoting themselves, about getting their agenda across, about making their name known, they don't want unity. If they're selfishly ambitious about their agenda, they don't want unity. Why? Because oftentimes, unity is not going to benefit them. Disunity can. They might can get the church to divide and they can take a little group with them and they can kind of rule over that little group. That benefits them. And sadly, they don't even often realize how selfishly ambitious they are. But I'm telling you right now, 
that this will divide the church every time. If someone is arrogant, they're full of conceit, they won't seek unity either. Because unity might just mean that they have to admit that they're wrong. And humility is something that they can't quite grasp. Notice what Peter says here. Finally, all of you have unity of mind. How? Through sympathy, through brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. That, that, that's how you find unity. When you humble yourselves. Unity, again, it might admit that that person has to say, you know, I, I, was, I was wrong about this. And an arrogant person isn't about to say that. An arrogant person is going to hold their ground no matter what. They're not going to be open to reason. They're not going to seek common ground. And here's the problem. Brethren who are selfish and prideful can sometimes convince others that they're actually unity makers. That's the problem. In James chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, I find this interesting. James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Now notice this. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. What's James saying there? Well, what does he mean by their boasting and being false to the truth? He says, listen... If you are arrogant and selfish, don't, don't, don't act as if you're actually trying to pursue the truth. You're not pursuing the truth. You're boasting against the truth. You're just arrogant and selfish. Don't try and convince other people that you have this godly wisdom when in fact all it is is carnality. And it's division. You can be confident of this. If someone is claiming to want unity... But the discussion is always focused on them, their agenda, their convictions, and they're constantly seeking ways to divide instead of trying to find ways that they can unite. They are a peace breaker. They are not a peacemaker. And Paul tells us what to do with such people in Titus chapter 3 and verse 10. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Now, in contrast to this mentality, in verse 4, Paul presents two other attitudes to combat that, and that is humility and selflessness. The two go hand in hand. He says, don't simply look upon your own needs. Look upon the needs of another. Don't count other people more valuable than yourself. Have some humility about you. Now, I love what C.S. Lewis had to say about humility. He said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. It's thinking about yourself less. Looking at someone and saying, this person has value. Uh, their, their needs are just as legitimate as my needs. And if I'm doing that, if I'm looking at someone and saying, I value this person, I'm esteeming this person better than me, greater than me, I'm considering their needs, it's a lot harder to cut someone off and just to cast them aside when you're thinking about someone like that. He says, if you want to pursue unity, you have to have this mindset, this mentality, in which you're willing to humble yourself before another. And I wonder... How many churches today could have maintained their unity if someone just would have stepped back from the fray of things and would have just said, brother, listen, I know that we're on opposite ends of this, but I love you and I, I care about you and I want to be unified. I want us, I want us to find some common ground here. I want us to, to find a way to be unified. How many problems in the church? I mean, again, do you need the cross or don't you? Did you need Jesus? Okay, so if you're confessing, I need Jesus, what can you say? You can say, I can be wrong. In fact, I have been wrong many, 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 many times. That's what I'm saying when I come to Jesus. And so if I'm saying it when I come to Jesus, 
Why can't I say it when I'm talking with my brother in Christ? I could be wrong here. Now let's talk about this. Help me to see, and, and I'll try and help you to see my side of things. That's what Christians do. We've got too many Christians that are acting like the world. And they're not passionate about the unity that's to be sought in Jesus Christ. It's a sad reality. So we're beginning to see the difficult work of Christian unity. And that's, that's hard because we take a lot of joy in it, right? I take a lot of joy with being unified with you this morning. But it's hard work sometimes to keep Christian unity. It's hard work. So what is it that motivates us to pursue that? Because there's certain times where, if we're being honest with ourselves, we just want to cut people off, right? I mean, because that's, <laughs> that's a lot easier. Cut them off and be done with them. So what motivates us to pursue Christian unity? Well, our motivation for unity is what we see in Jesus. Verses 5 through 8, Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. That is, if you are in Christ Jesus, which he already said they are in Christ Jesus in verse 1, if you're in Christ Jesus, then this is the mindset you should have because this is the mindset that Jesus had. If you're claiming to be a part of the body of Jesus, then you should be seeking unity because this is the type of thing that Jesus did. This is one of the earliest, uh, verses 5 through 8, it's one of the earliest writings concerning the nature of Jesus. It's thought possibly to be the stanzas to an early Christian hymn. The fact that Jesus emptied himself, taking on the form of servant. But it's also one of the earliest writings declaring the deity of Jesus. That he was equal with God and is equal with God. But Paul holds up Jesus as the embodiment of the humble, selfless mind he previously discussed. So what did Jesus give up for the sake of the unity of his people? Because Paul will talk about in Ephesians 2 how the main focus of Jesus in the cross is to reconcile all people to him through one body. So what did Jesus give up? For the sake of the unity of his people. Well, number one, it says he gave up his position. He was in the form of God, not counting quality with God, a thing to be grasped. That, that I, has the idea of someone who is grasping and firming, uh, holding on to something firmly. He says he was there with God, reigning. He didn't have to come down here, but he did. He didn't look at that and say, well, it's not really worth it. Look at what I have to give up. All of this. He gave up his position. He gave up his prestige. Verse 7, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Now, we do an entire sermon just on that, that verse. That God became man. That's the scandal of the cross. I mean, how do you wrap your mind around that? He gave up prestige. And he gave up his prerogative. Notice verse 8. Being found in the human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. What are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of the church? What are you willing to give up to unify God's people? Are you willing to give up your position? Are you willing to give up your prestige? Are you willing to give up your prerogative? For the unity of the body? Maybe it would help us, and I've thought of this before, maybe it would help us if when we're arguing with another Christian and we're trying to find ways to divide, maybe it would help us if we viewed ourselves as if we were arguing at the foot of the cross while Jesus is hanging there. He's hanging there and he's bleeding out and he's being tortured and you've got two Christians standing here saying, well, hey, you won't believe what he did. He did this, you won't believe. Jesus, why don't you? In his labored breaths, coming in, 
and out and the blood is dripping from his head and he's suffering and he's dying and his followers can't learn how to be unified. It is one of the great tragedies of the American church. Constantly, Paul calls us back to the cross. You, you're fighting. Look here. Look here. Look at the cross. Look what was done. See the glory there. See the tragedy there. Jesus is central. He is the basis and the character of our unity, the motivation for our unity. He is not only the motivator, but our goal. Let's seek that. Let's seek Him together. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, Paul writes this, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Are you passionate about pursuing Christian unity? Are you eager? For it. Is that what you want? Is that, is that at the heart? I mean, be honest with yourself. Are you eager about pursuing Christian unity? I hope so. Because it doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. Notice what he says here. The unity of who? The unity of the Spirit. <laughs> Jacob doesn't make unity. The Spirit makes unity among God's people. It's His unity. And the actions that I do can either harm that or help it. But either way, it doesn't belong to me. And so I better treat it with the reverence that it deserves. Have you been unified with God's people? Are you pursuing a joyful faith in the unity of God's people this morning? Uh, maybe you haven't become as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, unified or one spirit with the Lord. You haven't obeyed the gospel. You haven't placed your faith in Him, repented of your sins, confessed His name, be baptized for the remission of your sins. You can do that this morning. You can ask for the prayers of the church. Whatever you need is, why don't you come? As together we stand and as we sing. Oh.